Uh, I had written several questions while uh, I was following your uh, presentation, sure. but I think I will start with the last one uh, because it is a very intriguing one. Yeah, you, you provoke us to think about these new challenges and searching for new conceptual frameworks and theories. And of course, this is so difficult because how can we how can we do it? Yeah, we have socialized in certain world intellectual traditions. And it's uh, and we're trapped there, yeah. So it's so difficult to to develop these new conceptual frameworks. And you also have emphasized that the role of China is significant now, and it will be even more significant in the future. So maybe one of the you know um, ways of uh, thinking about our future would be uh, to borrow some intellectual tradition from this country, you, you know, like to understand yeah. their culture better, their intellectual tradition, how do they see the world, try to understand them and also try to adjust, not, not necessarily adjust, but at least to, to get some inspiration from them. Or maybe you believe that this uh, poses certain threats uh, in a way that you, you have said yourself that China poses certain challenges to the world. So maybe adjusting our worldviews to their tradition um, could be wrong. So can you somehow speculate about it, about yeah. you know, uh, the opportunity to learn from them, but also to be careful with what, how, how far can we go? Yeah, Timo, that, th thanks for this uh, wonderful uh, way to start. Um, the way we see this is that China started to decolonize itself from the West. Mm -hmm. and there was a time where China was going after the Western icons, right? The Western brands and all that. And, and I think over the years, uh, a bit of a uh, uh, combination between the Cultural Revolution that happened that brought the Communist Party to power to the fact of the, the one, you know, one party system. Um, that, of course, believes in surveillance and control as an only way for uh, the degree of complexity you have in a country like China. We start to notice the rise of Chinese uh, alternatives to the Western ones. And over time, if you have generation of people that are born only exposed to that, uh, you kind of get, allow me the term, indoctrinated into a Chinese way of thinking. I have a friend called uh, Ted Sun who wrote a book about 10 years ago called Inside the Chinese Mind. I think we really have, Timothy, to go inside the Chinese mind to understand. You know, it, back in the 1950, no matter whether you were American or not, you had to understand the Americans, to understand the way the world was about to be designed, right? We had to. All of us became colonized to the American idea one way or the other because we had to. I think it's the same now. We have to get closer to the Chinese way of thinking for us to understand where this country is currently heading and going. And what you said is correct. Can we borrow ideas? Can we work with them? You know, I always find that in the uh, ability to have a conversation between a, with with a, with a, uh, a party, you can say my way versus your way. You can say, can we create the third way that is reconciling some of this? So I think there is a, a one of the comment that we learned uh, from uh, Parakana, who is uh, somebody that we know and we know his work. He said. The world is, com is converging in a number of different ways, but is culturally diverging as well. Because of subculture, tribalism, we have to, I think, make a step towards integration somehow. Because thinking that we'll ever be able to simply antagonize China, that's not going to go working. So I think moving closer and understanding is really, and let me finish with this, the way we have been colonized to the American principle, the Western principle for most of our 20th century, we have to colonize ourselves, you know, intellectually also to the Chinese principles, not because we have to embrace them, but because we have to understand them. Right? I think that's, that's clearly one area mm -hmm. of uh, intervention. Yeah, I, uh, I can't stop, cannot help myself, but thinking about, you know, Russia and Ukraine now, and I, I, I think a lot of intellectuals also have noticed uh, that this desire or maybe um, attempt to understand Russia uh, by Western intellectuals has also created sort of um, romanticized narratives of Russia. Yeah? And, and some people were lured into these romanticized narratives. Uh, yeah. So I think this can be also an, powerful um, example to all of us. So, you know, to build some uh, 
uh, boundaries. Yeah, when we want and and to to have this clear strategy whether we want to understand someone, appreciate someone, uh, uh, you know, have some cultural exchanges, but not to get lost into uh, narratives and uh, romanticized uh, ideas because it could be. Uh, yeah, it could be dangerous. It could be dangerous Absolutely. for our national security. Well, Timofey, you, you are experiencing the, the price of having underestimated the narrative in the way it should have been. You know, and that's a critique to, uh, you know, the West for the last 20 years. We have fundamentally misunderstood Russia. Yeah. On the contrary, we were thinking that uh, Russia was uh, leaning towards the West uh, not understanding that it was never a lean into words, right? It was uh, creating leverage. Mm -hmm. I think um, across so many different U.S. presidents as well, we have seen so many mistakes from uh, Clinton to uh, George Bush to, uh, to some extent, even Obama, right? Um, Trump, uh, for us to really not having understood that thinking behind. I think country like Ukraine, this conversation could have never been so easily done because you have the historical context to understand Russia better than other parts of the West, right? But outside of uh, that context, we were all romanticizing, as you say, with that. I think, again, we cannot uh, afford the same mistake with a country like uh, uh, like China. I think we have to remember, and, and uh, I know I'm using this because I know in, in academic terms, we have the ability to be intellectually free, right? Russia is economically quite inconsequential, but it's uh, just because it's a military power. If it wasn't for the military power, a country like Russia would constitute roughly 3% of the global GDP. So it's actually Russia with 145 million people as the same GDP of a country like Spain. And with the devaluation of the depreciation of the ruble, likely a country becoming like Portugal, I think it was the same Taleb who wrote it on Twitter. So we, we, we had to imagine that the economic dissonance of a country like Russia is compensated exclusively by the military cap capabilities. And I think this is a mistake that we have made by thinking that just because it's a country with a relatively modest economic condition, it doesn't necessarily um, build the threat. And last on this, haven't we really paid a high price on underestimating the conversation of dependency on energy right now? Eastern Europe today understanding that if you are dependent by 50% of your energy intake from a country, that by itself is economic fallacy, right? But anyway, can you imagine the number of people who got elected on the promise of having more affordable energy? But that's really it's sleeping with the enemy, so to say. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. But also it brings me, you know, to the next question. I think Please. it's a nice segue. Um, because you have also mentioned this idea of new types of leadership um, in this world. And I want to ask you uh, maybe it's about some specifics, because we live in this very complicated global world with these large scale complicated international organizations, you know, like European Union, NATO, mm -hmm. and sometimes these organizations, you know, they can be slow in their response and reaction to, to growing challenges. And obviously mm -hmm. we have this decentralized uh, academics and intellectuals and businesses who who have this alarm system, you know, they, they see new challenges, new opportunities, and they, like you do, you, you talk about them in, um, in your lectures, in your books, and also you have said that you advise uh, to governments. Yeah. Uh, but nevertheless, I imagine that it's very difficult to, to have this, you know, to, to manage these quick changes, how to leverage leadership in this world, which is so much regulated. Yeah, I, uh, and I, I think a lot of Europeans uh, also have experienced this negative um, things with populism. You can say yeah. that populists are people who take uh, leverage and who propose this dramatic, radical ideas, how to change world, and then everything collapses. So mm -hmm. Europeans and Americans, they have built the system to protect against wild, crazy ideas. On the other hand, we want wild and crazy ideas to be heard and to elevate up to the you know, top offices. Yeah. So is there any practical solution? How can we 
build the system. Maybe we should create one more organization that will be called International Office of Crazy Ideas. Maybe <laughs> we should uh, have some advisory boards uh, or maybe, uh, I don't know, we should trust, uh, not just trust to intellectuals, but have some offices with them. I, I don't know. Can you share your yeah. experience, uh, how you advise to governments and whether you, you and your colleagues have these ideas, how to practically implement uh, the structure of leadership? Yeah, that, uh, thanks for this. Uh, uh, that's a complex question, so I'll, I'll try my best with your question, uh, Timofey. Um, I think what governments lacks is the ability to pivot and experiment policy to the point in which you can learn about policy and policy failure, policy fallacy, assumption. You know, we have this uh, very uh, static view that there is an input, which is the policy, and there is the output, which is the expected outcome. And of course, policy are nonlinear. So I guess it starts by understanding if we accept that complex system with large degree of interdependency are nonlinear, we start rethinking that success rate is not based in setting the policy. Success rate is based on approximating the policy to what you're trying to achieve. That means that building what a colleague of mine called Landry Signet calls agile governance is really the essence of the future of the government, uh, Timofi, in the, in the years to come. Can we think of government in an entrepreneurial format? And I think, put it this way, a private investors understand return on investment. You know, we teach this in, in many courses we teach in, in uh, universities. But government don't, doesn't have the idea of return on public value in the same way. So I think if we are able to understand that return on public value happens by taking risks, then those crazy ideas can be eventually pivoted, tried. And how do we see this happening in practical terms? We're looking at country like that we all talk about, right? From Singapore to Israel to the UAE, now to some extent, some part of the Saudi government to country like Estonia that did not exist before 1989, where I happened to know uh, Ilves at the time I was at the World Economic Forum, or a country even like Finland, right? Uh, what they do, they fundamentally experiment, and they experiment without feeling that experimentation is a form of stigmatization or failure. So if we can see how this small country have been able to largely experiment, we understand that the role of government in the 21st century is not static and based on centralized ways of operating. It's much more decentralized, territorial, flexible, to some extent asymmetrical because it's quite normal, but very agile and capable of learning from the experience how to move the, the, the policy. I, I would say that fundamentally is where I see this. These are some of the examples we see currently running and um, Ilves, uh, the former president of Estonia, has an anecdote, says, you know, it was the time in which Estonia was trying to integrate e-government. How do you do this? Well, he was able to say, how many times do we fill up the form and what is the cost for us to do that? So the moment we're able to convert traditional behavior into an economic cost, you can eventually try to remove the cost from the balance sheet. So rethinking, I guess, uh, processes for government in a way that are going in the direction of what we need, likely we'll see the rise of uh, more innovative and radical ideas emerging. It goes from small things like technology, but uh, you know, Michael Porter, who, with, with whom I have worked at the time I was at Harvard, um, wrote something in 2017 called Why uh, Politics is Failing in America. And his fundamental argument is that politics is failing in America for the lack of competition because basically he's a Democrat or Republican, do not represent the majority of Americans, right? Either the majority of the intellectual capacity the country like the US has, right? So I think these are where we have to experiment. Governance, voting, technology, agile uh, governance, um, and eventually moving government into return on public value. Hello again. Please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube page where we have a selection of fantastic lectures and conversations with leading international scholars. And I encourage you to watch a video by Bruce Bueno de Mesquita, who is a famous political scientist. He is talking about selectoral theory, authoritarian regimes, and the risk of copes and mass uprisings. Thank you.